Cool, so welcome to the talk, the missing talk about API versioning and the evolution in the developer platform. Uh, my name is Serge, I'm in the Kubernetes ecosystem since 2016. I wrote probably way too many operators and broke way too many users with uh, CRD API versioning and that was the main motivation for this talk. Yeah, my name is Stefan Stenfermanski. I'm involved in CRD work for years, so lots of the things. The pain you are seeing might be uh, my fault. Um, we will see, but we have this talk to repair everything and fix everything. So there was a talk two, no, three hours ago. Um, I hear an echo here. Is, this... Is it okay? I think so. Can you hear me well? Okay, strange. So there was a talk in the same track um, before lunch, and the title is super similar, as you notice. So Nick gave a very, um, yeah, basically an introduction to the same topic, but very orthogonal. So um, if you haven't seen that, please watch the recording. It's a great um, complimentary addition to our talk. All right, so that's probably something that everybody of you see every day, right? I mean, at the end of the day, we are CRD developers and we provision like, well, we develop CRD APIs and like we have this little silly example here with a CRD of kind table. Uh, and we have some spec with a color, thickness, height, and some status condition with a cost. And obviously on the right hand side, you see the open API schema. Uh, maybe that's something you pay a little bit less attention to every day that corresponds to it, right? And that's sort of like something that we do every day, but something that we pay very little attention to very often is like this version, um, you know, qualifier up there that is saying version one. So let's say we want to change something in this CRD. We want to change the structure. We want to change the schema. Like in this case, we want to put thickness and the height. Like we want to like restructure it a little bit, put it under size, and maybe we want to rename like the status condition cost dollar or cost into cost dollars. So we change the schema, we change the version, and we call it a day, right? Like hands up whoever did this mistake already. Okay, Whew, I'm, I'm happy, I'm not alone. I did this mistake as well. You just broke the user if you just go it like so, okay? So like, what we want to show you in this talk that like, it's not as easy as just slapping like a new version uh, up there. You have to follow certain rules and certain patterns because Kubernetes has quite some amount of invariance imposed upon you. Um, so you cannot do that, unfortunately, just like so. And to make things a little bit complicated, I won't go into the details what's happening here, but this is like probably something that many of you already saw. This is the request handler chain of the API server. Uh, and we should have made red, red little boxes there, but anytime you see like this uh, keyword conversion, that's something where versions are being converted back and forth inside the API request handler chain. That is, if you think you're submitting a version to Kube API server and that stays like stable within the whole request handler chain, that's unfortunately not true. So when we start with the version one of the CRD, of this silly little table CRD, um, the world is simple, easy, and nice, right? I mean, the, uh, if the client submits a request towards API server, um, it submits a, like for instance, get a version one of the CRD, and it goes through sort of like a simplified version of, of the slide before through defaulting, um, admission, mutating admission, schema validation, and um, validation admission. At the end, it is being stored in V1 at its CD, and everything is perfect. And that's sort of like a picture that hopefully everybody has in, in, in their hands. Um, but the world is not that simple, because we have a like, special metadata information uh, attached to each um, CRD, and that is the so-called storage version. That tells Kube API server in what version to store um, a resource when it arrives at the API server. And guess what, how many storage versions can you specify at the same time? Like more than one, who thinks that you can specify more than one storage version at the same time? No, you can specify only one. So that's a bummer, right? So that means we can only tell API server, well, store everything in V1 and you can only specify one version. So let's say we have the V2 request for the same kind approaching at API server, uh, sort of like the same request handler chain is being run through defaulting, mutating admission, schema validation and validation, but at the end, conversion happens. And the funny thing is, and that's super counterintuitive, the uh, conversion happens back into V1. So like, despite we increased the version to V2, like things are being converted to V1. And guess what, if you didn't implement the conversion, nothing is converted. Like it's literally a no-op operation by default. So, um, long story short, what we must provide as CRD API developers is this conversion between V1 and V2. 
And to be a little bit academic, like if you if you like into math, like this is also called in that space uh, isomorphic behavior. That is, we have to be able to convert between v1 and v2 back and forth without loss of information. Otherwise, conversion and this whole request handle change um, chain will simply will not work. And it's even worse, you cannot only like do a one-way conversion from v1 to v2, you also must be able to convert from v2 to uh, v1 back. Like this round tripping is very important. Remember this request in the chain from before, right? I mean, our request arrives at v2, it is being stored in etcd in v1, and then uh, or in a subsequent uh, list or get operation, the same thing happens. It, it has to be wrapped as v1 from etcd converted back to v2. So th that needs to be a full round trip. So we have those like two statements up here, right? I mean, when anybody tells you, ah, an object exists as v1 and another as v2 in a Kubernetes, that's not really true. Yes, it, is, it may be stored in different versions in etcd, but a client can query any version it wants. It can query v1 and v2, and it has to get back the same data without any loss of information. And when everybody tells you v2 is a major version upgrade from v1 and we can change anything in the schema, that's also definitely not a true statement. You cannot change anything at will because of all the invariants that we just showed you. All right, so we have seen the right pass um, as pictures already. Um, to be a bit more applied here, so kubectl get tables. So our example is tables. Um, and we ask for them. So kubectl will choose one version. So, and it chooses the latest one. It doesn't choose the storage version. There's some order between versions. V2 is the latest one. It will do a V2 request. So it will basically go to the URL here and get all the tables. So there's a reading operation, as Sergey said, from V1 converted, defaulted, converted into a V2. And reading can be a get, can be a list. So if um, you do get tables, you will list the objects. So it's a listing operation. And this happens. Every object is converted. So that's what you get, tables in the v2 um, version. There's one syntax. There's a syntax to um, ask for v1. It look like, looks like that. So it's a resource name, and then the version, and then the group name. can do the same thing. Kubectl will ask for the other endpoint, the upper one. And um, you get the same objects, same two objects as v1. Again, this basically shows what Sergus has, uh, has said before. Ver uh, objects don't exist in a version. Every object which is part of a resource can be queried in every version which is served. All right, um, a very special client. Kubectl is easy. There are controllers in Kube. But they are not very different. The developer chooses a version to reconcile. So in the example here, the developer chose v2. So the controller running against this table resource here will see all objects as v2. So the statement that the informer behaves differently for v1 than for v2 is not true, right? Because the controller doesn't know. It asks for objects, gets all of them as v2, and whether the user used v1 for that, the controller will never see. All right, storage version. So as you have seen, there is one. If we want to promote that, we want to change to v2. As you see here, if you look on etcd again on the right side, nothing happens. That's surprising. Actually, you have to tell the API server to touch objects, to make them write again into etcd. And the API server is that clever. It will read the object from etcd. It will apply the patch. The patch is empty here in the example. It will not change anything, but it will write back the new storage version. So basically, that is what you have to do for every object. We did it for one, uh, one object here, the desk in the, uh, in the living room, and we have a desk in the office, the second one. Do the same thing, and everything is uniform again. In the past, you had to do that. There is work in Kubernetes at the moment for the storage version migrator. So there's a, an open source tool um, owned by the SIG API machinery, and this is being integrated into Kube. So this, this operation will soon be automatic. But at the moment, especially in old clusters, be aware of that. All right, so um, changing storage, storage versions at some point in time is something, I mean, on the dimension of time, right? This really plays an important role in CRD development, in API evolution. So that's the picture here. Um, we added v2 in April, and we changed the storage version in June, and somebody updated to the newest version via Helm. And from July, every new object written is a v2 object. 
so dimension of time. But this is actually not the case in practice. It's too easy. It's more like that. You do upgrades. You don't know when your users upgrade, but they will do that, and probably they will do it more often than you add new uh, major versions. So you have shades of green here, so you, you change your V1 API, maybe you add a field, um, change some validation. So you have a darker green here, and it's green, it's green, eventually social version is changed, everything is blue, but there are shades of blue. So that's basically the mental model um, of evolution of APIs in etcds, in users clusters. So that's what you have to think about when you do API evolution. All right, so as my dear colleague Sebastian Voskavitz is always saying, when in doubt, zoom out. There's a lot of detailed information that you got so far, like a lot of implementation details, low level stuff, was like, what is important for you, we will show you some patterns how to overcome those constraints, but you may develop much more in the future. And what's important for you is to get you know, home, like a mental model that you can reason about uh, when developing new patterns of API evolution. So when you think about it, you know, everything in computer science is about state machines, right? And a state machine is comprised of two things, a state and a state transition. Right? When we create resources and Kubernetes, we have a create, um, you know, a created state, and from there we can go on and like do various uh, update operations, update transitions, and we end up in new states, right? And so we end up like with a hu huge like state graph of possible of possible states and state transitions. So for our little silly table example here, uh, we can, for instance, update the color to red. That's a valid state transition, and we can up update the color to black. That's also cool. Oh, but we made a bug, right? We allowed negative values for the height, which kind of doesn't make sense, right? So like in this case, we identified during the development of the CRD, huh, the default height shouldn't be allowed to have negative values, but there is nothing in the schema that forbids that, right? So we identified that this is an invalid transition to a state that is also invalid. And that's something we want to prevent. And that's sort of like the actual important thing for you to remember, think of states, state, uh, state and state tra transitions, and of those invalid states you do, that you may end up uh, with when identifying uh, bugs in your, in your schema. And when you think of versions, it's really just two independent state machines, like a, like a V1 possible state machine and a V2 possible state machine, right, that might look very similar, potentially like in the 99 percentile of all the update operations, but for some things it may look different, for instance, the, the, the invalid uh, negative height, and what you have to do is to be able to convert between those state, state machines without loss of information. So um, while you know in etcd everything happens inside the like using the storage version uh, state machine, the thing on the on the left, the v1, you know for the user any any possible like state machine uh, that is represented here may be queried via the client. So when we bring back this time perspective that, that Stefan showed you, right and we again have this mental model of state machines, right? You may have like um, identified and fixed via through versions that in some initial version, V1 alpha 1, you have a negative height, and that initial state um, is invalid, right? It's, it's an invalid creation um, state. Um, and you fix it in, in, in V1, and it's not a valid uh, creation state in V1 anymore. But what is important, that inside etcd, still a negative state might be stored. So what you have to do as a CRD API developer is to not um, you know, have the user to be stuck, but sort of like have a one-way progression of your CRD API that eventually, you know, eventually consistent, sort of like this metaphor bringing it up again, um, you come up to a valid state machine that, that is the desired fixed state machine that you want to provision. And you also might do it through simple schema uh, um, evolution, right? So you might even have found out in your, in your V1 state machine that you released you know, uh, three weeks ago in the Helm upgrade, oh, we have this invalid uh, state of a negative height. You know, we want to prevent it uh, to be happening. And you, you can even fix the same, the schema or this invalid state machine inside the same version. Again, you want to prevent users to, to uh, create this new state. Uh, and you really want to have like this one-way progression without breaking users. Again, zooming out, think of these things as sort of like clouds of states uh, and state transitions where you have like possible um, valid or invalid states and you want to um, make sure that you don't get anybody stuck. And we will show you some patterns how to accomplish that in the next slides. Yeah, so this looks like mathematics. It's not really mathematics. <laughs> in practice, Understand your users. Understand how they use your product. 
There might be invalid states, like the negative height for the, for, the, for the table, but maybe no user ever used that, hopefully, because it doesn't make sense, right? Or you can use, I don't know, you can migrate your, um, yeah, some clusters, maybe you have access to them, you can watch them. Basically, use the knowledge of your application, how it's used, to reduce the state space. So it's not mathematics, it's just knowing um, how your software is used. All right, so who is in this phase at the moment? Everything is super complicated, right? And yes, it is super complicated. But um, yeah, the talk is about navigating the space. So you saw an, um, a mental model already. Now there's a section about tools. Um, we have seen some tools already in this request um, handler chain, and um, some of them I will highlight quickly. So that's a detailed picture of the API server, and this is our simplification. So first one I want to highlight, defaulting. Defaulting happens when you write an object to etcd, when you create, apply an object. If a field is not set, but there's a default, the default is applied. Um, that's obvious, kind of, um, that's what defaulting should do. There's a, ni uh, a nice addition to that, defaulting happens on read as well. So when you read an object which is old, like a half a year old object in etcd, and you added defaulting three weeks ago, kubectl get will, sh will show the default. So you can add defaults anytime. But it's not, it's not stored in etcd. Everything which is written gets the default, but old objects which were never um, touched for, for half a year, they don't have this value, but in the API it shows up anyway because it's applied in this stage. Yeah, this was one part already of open API um, schema validation in general. For every field you can give a type, you must give a type, and there are a number of, of um, properties in uh, OpenAPI v3 you can use, and most of you will know that, um, to restrict um, the values uh, for that field. There's one thing um, since 1.30 of Kubernetes, um, we have ratcheting. Ratcheting we will show in a, a more detailed slide later. Basically, imagine black tables are out, so you cannot produce black tables anymore, and you don't want that anybody creates a claim for a black table. We could remove that from our enum, right? And for simple operations, um, it's automatic that if you have a, a black table already, like there's a custom resource with a black color, you can still update that, although the black is not part of the enum anymore, as long as you don't change the color. When you start changing the color, it's over, then this applies. It's, it's a form of, or we call it ratcheting, it's part of 130. So it makes it a bit easier to strengthen validations. If you have found in a mistake, like the negative height, that's the way. If OpenAPI doesn't work, or it's not enough, not expressive enough, there's cell. It's an uh, expression language, small programming language where you can express things. And you can, can express things cross fields. You can give nice messages, more powerful than OpenAPI. Use that. It's available uh, for a couple of versions. There are a couple of policy languages, Caverno, Open, API, uh, Open Policy Agent, most of you will know. There's a new one, Validating Emission Policy, for quite some uh, few versions. Um, they have different exp expressivity, so choose the one you like. Um, do what you can do in those languages. If this is not enough, they have books, right? So you can write in Go or JavaScript, whatever you like. You can even mut mutate objects, so before they are even validated, you can... Um, do special defaulting, for example, defaulting, which is more complex, or any other thing we can, you can query any, any other resource and somehow combine them and mutate. And finally, validation you can do. And conversion, that's maybe the first thing everybody will touch when adding new versions. This must be a webhook nowadays. All right, that's a table. I don't go into details. Um, if you're in a recent version, the last three, four versions, you have most of that already. All right, patterns. Okay, so hands-on examples, stuff that works, that sort of like is somehow proven. Uh, and disclaimer, these are not all the known patterns. In fact, there, there, sh there, there will be like, uh, I'm, I'm very curious to explore more, um, and I want to explore more, but these are sort of like some of the known ones um, that you maybe also saw in like the previous uh, hands-on talk, right? Uh, first pattern, the rename pattern, right? I mean, the easy case, we want to rename a field. That's pretty easy. Like when you, when you remind like state, state machines, transitions, right? When you think about those two state machines like V2 and V1, yeah, I can think of the whole state machines being convertible be between each other. So that gives you already like a proof point that, yep, that should be doable, right? And yes, indeed it is. You have to do uh, the renaming. You have to do it in the webhook, uh, but it's definitely possible. So that's, that's like a solvable case. 
Um, the move pattern is also a solvable case. Again, going back to the state machine stuff, pretty easy. It's a little bit like renaming, but just moving. Um, it needs to be done in the webhook, right? So also this can be accomplished. You can, you can slap a v2, but again, like you must implement it in the webhook as well. Um, this pattern is probably used by 99.9% .9 of all the sort of like CRD API evolutions that I, that I saw. Uh, adding a new optional field. I mean, that's, that's pretty easy to see how those you know, state spaces are convertible between each other. And that's sort of like, fortunately, um, the, the, the majority of the cases of your API evolution, right? And in fact, you don't even have to bump the version number for that. So like the, the most dominant pattern that I saw here is like, we just add additional optional versions and we just leave the version as is, right? Um, and um, again, but if you do um, add a new version, uh, remember, you must add the same optional field in all previous versions as well, such that they become convertible. That's maybe something that some, some CRD API developers may forget. So like, when you add a new field to v2 that is optional, be sure to add it in v1 as well. Uh, one way to hack around this is to sort of like do an annotation in v1 uh, that represents the new field in v2, but that's actually discouraged. I mean, annotations are not validated. Um, you know, this could be maybe fixed via admission, but you know, uh, there could be like pre-existing annotations, but there is like, there is risks like CVE risks and other dragons lying. And uh, obviously this stuff cannot be migrated to real fields um, in the same version, right? So like that's, an, that's actually an anti-pattern. Yeah, so we want to show some patterns. It's not complete, um, but it shows you the, the, the mental model. So everything which comes now, just um, listen and um, try to consume or learn something from it. Um, I don't go into every detail here, but it gives you the flavor of, of the, the thoughts, the mental model you have to have. So required fields. In V2, I want to require a new field. In V1, yeah, I do the same thing. Is this a good change? Both sides require that field. Obviously, obviously it's not, right? Um, you break two things here. You create, or you, you break the creation of old manifests. Somebody might have a V1 object somewhere in GitOps uh, and applies it to a cluster. This is suddenly broken, right? Not a good thing. But also on, on updates, there might be objects in LCD which have V1, but they, they lack this field. And you cannot update them anymore. And you heard ratcheting as an example before. This doesn't apply to required by default, um, but you can build ratcheting required validation in a webhook, for example, in a mission. Um, then at least you fix updates, right? You can have old objects, they don't have this field, but you can still update and progress, basically. You'd, your users won't get, get stuck, but you will not allow creation. But still, also not good, breaking creation. So you can have something like that. It's asymmetric, right? You, you have the required in V2. In V1, it's still optional, it's defaulted. So you have this, this world where both sides are not the same. So you have different requirements for, for V2. And this happened in, in Cube itself. We have resources where we use such a pattern. And ratcheting, it's important. So very briefly, um, everything simple, like the first case here, is automatically uh, ratcheted. Um, there are ratcheted cell rules, so you can write something which references old self, and you can compare, check whether it's, for, um, it's valid before the update, but it still applies to create, and since 130, you can express that in cell, before you couldn't. And if this doesn't help, admission is always there to the rescue, of course. So ratcheting, keep it in mind, very important. And the last thing, um, this was mentioned in the earlier talk as well, so you want to upgrade from singular to, to plural, so field to fields. 42, it's easy, it's just the first element um, that's trivial. If that's the second element, so 42 and 13, you put it into the list in V2, and in V1, you put it, I mean, the first one as field, the second as 13. Is this a good um, solution for that? And if a field is removed, so the field is wiped, because maybe there's a patch removing the field, the 42, and you have different ways to now react, right? What is the semantics of that? You keep the field, the 13, or maybe you move up the 13 to the singular field. Maybe you, you wipe everything. And I don't expect an answer, but if you play that through, um, you will get a lot of edge cases. And you have to think about old clients doing that. Maybe an old client doesn't know about the fields. It just drops it, but it changes the singular field. And the proposed solution here is that one. It repeats repeats the, uh, the 42 inside of the slice, 
and keeps it in the singular as well, because then you, you can distinguish between old clients and patches, so it makes it easier to, to solve all the edge cases. No details here. Um, there's a document from, from SIG Architecture which plays through this example, many edge cases. Um, it's complicated, avoid it if you can. If you can't avoid that, at least this, this um, example is, is, is known, so we know how to solve that. Read the document, there are many details. Okay, so if nothing helps, we have a yellow pattern for you. So that's kind of cool. Um, but it's not really cool. So anything you can say you, you, in, in Kubernetes, you have this qualifier, X Kubernetes preserve unknown fields, which you know, yes, I see. I, I, know, I know, I know, the insiders don't like that. I don't like it either, it's actually discouraged. It's, everything is on your own. I mean, you have the full freedom of the whole, whole uh, schema. You can store arbitrary JSON blobs in there. Uh, but you are like on your complete own, but you are still in this idiomatic world of Kubernetes. I would never ever use this, um, but it's definitely some approach. And the question is, is there something in between, right? Um, we have this you know, world of Kubernetes versioning that is idiomatic uh, on one extreme, and then we have this YOLO pattern, and like, can we somehow combine those two and make something in between? And that's where we came up like, with this major version pattern, or patterns, right? When you think about all those you know, uh, transitions and staying idiomatic in Kubernetes versioning, you know, you know, when you think hard, it's a little bit like similar to semantic versioning, right? I mean, in semantic versioning, the minor version does not allow you to sort of like do breaking changes. So like all the patterns that you saw before, like we, we, we qualify as sort of like minor version patterns. Major version patterns would allow you to do real breaking changes and still stay in the idiomatic world of Kubernetes. So one solution to the problem is invent a new CRD. I mean, the most famous example would be like the progression from the, from the ingress CRD to the gateway CRD, right? I mean, so you just invent a new kind, like in this case, bar, right? You have completely two independent state machines. There is no necessity to convert between them at all because they are completely separate CRDs. That's kind of cool. Well, it's not kind of cool because you have no help from Kubernetes to convert between those things. So you have to provide some sort of a scripting or some documentation or whatever, but it allows you to freely move and it allows you to have uh, resources inside the cluster which are still a, as a kind foo and a kind bar at the same time. If you want to have like something that looks like a foo and smells like a foo, um, you know, but you still want to have it a separate CRD, you can apply the SAC and just like encode a major version inside the group. So you could have like a group v2 slash v1 of kind foo, which would be like a 2.1 of your CRD. From the perspective of Kubernetes, they are like completely different CRDs, but the user has the impression it's still kind foo, right? But you, you can go crazy with the schema in there, right? So um, again, new CRD pattern. And when you use this new CRD pattern and you want to like add, like, for instance, experimental fields, and you don't want to pollute your stable API, like even not by introducing like a v2 alpha 1 API, you could like create this funky v2 alpha 1 CRD, add your experimental jazz in there, like your, your completely crazy schema changes, have a special controller that reconciles that experimental CRD, create a stable um, group V1 CRD with setting an owner reference and then play around with new features without touching sort of like the stable CRD API versions. Kind of works. Another variant is what we call the embedded versions pattern. Remember from the minor version patterns, adding new optional fields is kind of innocent. So why not have like version specs inside your CRD? You could have like an optional field that is called V1 and another optional field that is called V2, and underneath that, you can go crazy with the schema changes, right? Um, again, even if you have lots of information, right, I mean, that's, that's the trade-off that you have, but you still stay sort of like in this, in this idiomatic world, and you don't force users to create new resources as if you would do with the new CRD pattern, right? Again, like, the trade-off is you have two levels of versioning, and by the way, we use this pattern in our operator uh, at MongoDB with the Atlas Kubernetes version operator because we have like so many API changes uh, on our backend, right? And we didn't even call them v1 and v2, but we made them so, like semantically like uh, haptical to the users, so they have like a like a meaning. A slight variant of this like embedded pattern where you, where you, uh, it is required to have a webhook is that. Let's say you want to have like real schema changes inside your spec, but still stay like in this idiomatic world of Kubernetes versioning. So that might be a possible hack. So in the version v1, you have like an old field, uh, which is required if it is not v2. Again, like you have to solve this in admission uh, and, and inside the webhook, and add the whole ev like ev evolved v2 spec 
as an optional body in V1 to be convertible back and forth. And conversely, you can add like a new field in V2, right, um, that is required if not V1, and have like the whole V1 uh, body, um, you know, specified as the V1 field. It's not pretty, you, like you, you, again, if you have schema changes that have this loss of information, that's still a viable path, but again, um, it makes the CRD look like literally pretty, like you have this whole fancy new schema inside V2, but you do need a webhook. So, trade-offs, like we have those minor version patterns that stay in the uh, idiomatic world of uh, Kubernetes, and you know, the trade-off there is obviously you must maintain conversion between all versions. Like this loss of, loss of information, right, is, is very important. And all served versions must be supported, no matter how, how far you've progressed with the API. This, these major version patterns are not, not cube-like. Like, you know, it would probably be never ever accepted for, for any cube core resources like pods or deployments, right? And as we figured, updates must potentially be handled externally via scripting, documentation, or whatsoever. So when it comes to recommendations, and we are like a little bit careful here with recommendations, but that's like by intuition, the minor version patterns are a good fit if you fully maintain the API. You have 100% control over it, right? Um, and as you figured, and you know, Stefan showed you the, the many dragons that lie in those minor version patterns for, with the example of the singular and plural fields, they are very well suited if you have a low frequency of changes. If your API is constantly changing, you literally go crazy with those, you know, maintaining those invariants from the minor version pattern world. Uh, but on the other side, obviously, you have seamless and fully automated updates, and if that's required, well, then you have to stay in that world. The major version patterns, you know, are suitable potentially if you're if the API that you're exposing like represents or maps a completely foreign API that you don't have control over. And that for like you're literally like a proxy and you know software as a service style operators are you know known for that. Or if you think of you know my operator that is a proxy to sort of like a, a, a remote service or like I don't know cross plane providers or something like that. All these APIs in background are changing constantly. Right? So there is a high frequency of changes. Then these sorts of like major version patterns may be suitable. But again you have not this nice conversion back and forth. There is potentially some manual steps involved in between. And again, yeah, as I mentioned, manual user-involved scripted updates are acceptable in this case. Yeah, so repeating very quickly the most important slides. Please don't leave the talk and just take this with you. I hope, I mean, this is something um, which might help people who come to this versioning thing in Kubernetes. This is super important, like it is not a property of an object which version it is, right? It's not stored um, in a way that the API can, can tell you this is a v1 object and this is a v2 object. You can query objects in every version, all objects of a, of a resource. Second thing is v2, v1 look like major version updates, like, like in Zemware, it's not, right? They are actually minor versions and you have a lot of constraints. And that's a mental model, so state machines created objects, many, many transitions, many are valid, some are invalid, um, you have to maintain your schemas. Most importantly, that's your job, right? Don't get anybody stuck. Remember what might be in etcd in some users' clusters and keep those resources be, be up, updatable, basically. Don't force them to suddenly be in some immutable state and they can basically just do one thing, delete the objects and recreate. So make your users happy even if they have old data and maybe um, went a path which was not intended. And know your users um, and basically make use of that when, when, um, yeah, when improving your, your, your schemas. It's not mathematics, it's, it's some trade-off or some estimate what, whether something has been used or not. You can use your operators, feedback of them, metrics, whatever. Um, to get this information, this is helpful to, to go or to, to, to navigate the API evolution. All right. That's all I wanted to have to talk about. Thank you.